Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, distinguished honorable speaker, distinguished, distinguished honorable members of the National Assembly, we are indeed very grateful for this opportunity to come before you once again to chart the way forward for our nation together. We are always grateful for the frank discussions that are held in this August Assembly as we always leave with better plans and ideas for the development of this country. It is like a refinery of ideas. I have listened very keenly to all the interventions and we are grateful for them. We will endeavor to look into each one of them. They are all very important. Thus kindly we are with us. We've also taken note of the special committee's findings and recommendations, and we'll endeavor to make sure that, that we, we register improvements on all of them. This is a very important period in our existence as a country. We have patiently listened, as I mentioned, to all the deliberations, and it has enriched us greatly. By way of giving you the general overview, globally since the 31st December 2019 and as of 15th May 2020, a total of 24,338,600 million Six hundred and fifty eight cases of COVID nineteen in accordance with the applied case definitions in the affected countries have been reported. Of these two hundred and ninety seven thousand one hundred and nineteen deaths were registered. Africa has registered fifty four thousand one hundred and ninety confirmed cases with 1,623 deaths registered so far. Senegal, our closest neighbor, has registered a total of 2,189, with a total fatality of 23. The Gambia, as of yesterday, has registered 23 cases with one death. We've been carrying out a lot of contact tracing in this country. Contract tracing is a cornerstone of the response in the prevention and containment stages. At first, all attempts were geared towards following people who had returned from hotspot countries. This is before quarantine started. These people of interest were, uh, were asked to home isolate and were followed routinely by our health personnel for the development of symptoms. Those who developed symptoms were tested. Of those people, 350 were followed for 14 days. Now the contact tracing is concentrated on following the contacts of the confirmed cases and the contacts of contacts. Once the high risk contacts are identified, they are quarantined and the low risk cases are followed at home for two weeks. The target for contact tracing is 790 and 789 have been traced successfully. Of the low risk being followed, 105 to were the total. And out of that, we went beyond to have followed 109 cases. The quarantine. Quarantine was started in early March 2020. Initially, it started with people traveling into the country from hotspot countries, hotspot zones. Initially, this was shrouded with challenges as many of the people were not cooperating. Quarantine is one of the interventions that has yielded so much dividend in the Gambia. Most of our positive cases, in fact, 76.9% of 
were all confirmed while undergoing quarantine. That means the risk of their association with the people when they became positive, when they started shedding the virus, was very low because they were already in quarantine. That means that they would have been identified by the contact tracing team and be kept under our watchful eyes. We were on our own able to start testing for, the, for those people in quarantine before discharge. This was not in any recommendation or guideline when we started, but it has turned out to be a very great intervention. And as we speak here, many countries have adopted that. We started here in this Gambia, even well before the WHO recommended it, because we thought it made sense because there was a period at which people start shedding the virus, and that is when they can, the virus can be obtained for a positive test. Before then, they would not be positive. So we thought it was important to test anybody who had undergone quarantine before they were discharged, and many countries are following suit now. Of course, as we mentioned, this might be because if one tests early, those contacts, before they start shedding the virus, they will initially be negative, when the reality actually is that they are in fact positive. This has prevented many infected people being discharged into the community. This, however, is very expensive. It's a very expensive intervention, but it is one that has yielded dividend. As I mentioned earlier, 23 confirmed cases out of those 17 were diagnosed whilst in quarantine. Currently, we have 94 people in quarantine and 375 have completed the quarantine as we speak. I'm happy to know that both the Special Committee and the Health Select Committee had visited the quarantine sites. These are hotels with great services. Our health personnel and security officers also are present in those centers 24 hours to ensure the health and security needs are addressed. We have tried to make it as comfortable as possible for the people in quarantine, but of course, unfortunately, it can never replace their homes. So occasionally you see complaints on the media, but they have been taken very, very, very good care of. The average room has a television, an air conditioner, and even internet facilities. We have received a lot of commendation from people who live our facilities, but of course a few concerns have been raised, and certainly few people will never be satisfied with whatever is given to them. But at this juncture, I think as a country, we have tried very hard because we have seen big countries in Africa. I'll mention two examples. One of them took people to a quarantine center when they came from overseas and asked them to pay for themselves and left them there. Another big country took them to a quarantine center and asked people to pay. When they made noise, they took them out, took them to a primary school, left them there, threw mattresses at them, and then said it was their business and put security forces. Of course, Gambia, we never dream of that. So we have done our best to give our people a dignified treatment. As at present, we have spent more than $20 million in quarantine facilities. This will go up if we are still in the containment stage. If we are unlucky to slip into the mitigation stage where there are not so many community, where there are so many community transmissions that we do not even know the source of those transmissions at that point, because it could be so overwhelming that you don't know now who gave it to who. Then the strategy will be home isolation. 
of infected and suspected cases. And we know how difficult that is in our communities while we all live together, as had been mentioned by previous honorable members, speakers here. We live together, we eat together. Home isolation is easier for communities in the West, many of who were already isolated by their natural way of living. But it is very difficult for us in this country because our natural way of living is socialization. At present, our containment stage is going well, it's going on well, as we almost know the epidemiological link of almost all the cases and all known contacts have been traced and tested. Coming to testing, testing is the cornerstone of this response. The recommended testing level is now at least 2% of the population. The countries that have done a lot of testing have tested between 40 to 60,000 per million people. After this crisis, if we had 30,000 tested, we would have been in that range. But we want to go a little beyond that because of the way we live together here in our communities. As an example, India has tested 1,480 per million. That's what India has tested because of their population. And that is far below what the recommended number, total number is. The country that has done the highest number of tests so far is Portugal, and they have done 58,827 per million population. As of now, the Gambia has conducted 1,440 tests and have confirmed 23 positive test results. That means, as of now, we are doing about 700 tests per million people. The case definition has been widened now. That means there is some modification as to what, test, what cases should be tested. So the case definition being widened to include all cases with symptoms of fever or cough and one other symptom. These are the people who need to be tested. Travel history and history of contact, which used to be part of the case definition, are no longer considered necessary in the definition of what we call a suspected case. This, therefore, will lead to an increase in the number of people to be tested and isolated. However, testing without symptoms is not recommended except for health workers who are involved in the management of these patients. But as we see, recommendations are there, but countries are supposed to take the recommendations and adapt based on their national realities. The way our markets are, the way our ferries are, the way our, our fishing ports are, uh, is giving us more ideas to go into those highly densely populated areas to test more and more people. And this is the plan of the ministry. As of now, we are using a PCR testing in MRC Fajara, and we are happy to inform uh, this, uh, the honorable members here that our Kotru National Public Health Laboratory is ready and they'll be starting, they'll start doing the testing, inshallah, next week. MRC Gambia is also extending the testing sites to Keneva and Base so that people do not have to come all the way down here to get tested. We are also hoping that once the gene expert cartridge is available to developing countries, we can have six other sites tested we have gene expert machines, but the machines are locked by the manufacturers. That's the way they do their business. Now, cartridges have been manufactured specifically for COVID-19, but they have not been made available to developing countries yet. We learned that one big country has decided for them not to be exported. When that export ban is lifted, we hope to get these machines. And that means we can do more testing because the test becomes less dangerous for the laboratory staff then 
and it can be done in more, at more sites. We have six gene expert machines across the length and breadth of this country. Risk communication is ongoing. A lot of work has been done on the radio, on the TV, billboards, posters have been circulated. We've been having daily uh, media briefings by the ministry, myself and uh, the entire team to help sensitize people, to communicate to the people, to give them the updates. This has been ongoing and certainly the role the honorable members played in the sensitization has been remarkable because a lot of communities that we visited, you had visited them before we got there when I went to uh, up country recently and most of those communities have attested to the information being shared to them. We want to use the opportunity to thank you very much. However, honorable members, Madam Speaker, distinguished honorable members, we are very concerned with the rate of false information in our communities, especially the use of WhatsApp messages. False information has been very det detrimental to our collective efforts to fight COVID-19. They range from all sources, people scaring people, people talking about immunization that is not true. This has a detrimental effect because now, as mentioned by one honorable member, I think of challenging, women are scared to take their children for routine immunization. That means COVID could be over and we in our communities experience outbreaks of measles, yellow fever, tuberculosis and other diseases just because women were afraid to take their people uh, for vaccination. And we appeal to venerable members to help advocate against this practice. Isolation centers. There are 13 isolation centers located in different health facilities in the country. These are usually one or two rooms in a facility that are earmarked to keep suspected cases until confirmation is made. Whilst there, there would be a team trained in infection prevention and control to take care of these patients. The people put in isolation centers are usually symptomatic and do not on average spend up to 48 hours in these centers. Once the result is out, they are either transferred to the treatment center if it is positive and if it is negative they are taken back into the patient pool of that facility to be treat, treated as per their diagnosis. Isolation facilities are in the following uh, centers, SL District Hospital, Sibano, the Work Clinic, Buyam General Hospital, Soma District Hospital, Bansan General Hospital, Carnifing General Hospital, Edward Francis Moore General, uh, Teaching Hospital, Basse District Hospital, Farafenya District General Hospital, Rikama District Hospital, Kaur Major Health Center, Fajikunda Health Center, and Bundung Maternal and Child Health Hospital. Some of these are earmarked for renovation and expansion, but they are presently usable. Treatment centers, those are the centers where after isolation, the patients that have tested positive will be taken to the treatment centers. In general, there are going to be 14 treatment centers. 14 treatment centers will be functional for the response. The following are the ones available and ready at present. The one at sanitarium. Uh, that's for West Coast Health Region 1. Uh, the Deban Clinic, the first phase is ready and has 14 beds. Sanitarium has uh, 42 beds. Now, Deban, these are all in West, West Coast uh, Health Region 1. MRC Fajara equally has 30 beds for, for treatment. However, there are main... Uh, the wards are available as well if there is a surge, that is 42 beds as well. The following facilities are either under renovation or construction. Uh, Sukuta, that's for West, West, Western Region 1. MRC Keneba and the Basse sites. 
Kafuta, uh, the second phase of the Deban Clinic, Soma, Kanuma, Njabakunda, Wasupalang, Bansang General Hospital, Palang itself, Base Facility, and Yerobaol. These are all going to get treatment centers. The idea is to have at least one treatment facility in each health region to avoid movement of patients and thus lessen the risk of drivers, the risk to the drivers and the staff. The criteria used for selection of treatment centers include accessibility to the road, access to water and electricity, proximity to a major health facility for laboratory support, and the possibility of getting accommodation for the staff who are going to be involved in the treatment of these patients. E procurement of equipment. At present, we have now gotten 20 ventilators, honorable. We've gotten more since uh, after your talk. We've gotten 20 ventilators now that are ready uh, to be used as and when we need them. The procurement, uh, the equipment that are supposed to be procured include ventilators, X-ray machines, ultrasound machines, patient monitors, ambulances, 33 ambulances, uh, an honorable member asked, the ambulances are supposed to be 33. The procurement process by both the World Bank and the Gambia government will soon be completed and the equipment will soon be here. The government has asked the Turkish government to help airlift these items free of charge to this country, and it is to the tune of 12 million US dollars. It is believed that the pandemic could worsen in Africa, and the problem is that most of our health systems are weak. So we thought this is an opportunity to strengthen our health system so that they are robust enough to deal with the COVID pandemic as well as the day after. Projections. At the beginning of the pandemic in the Gambia, the projections on the disease were that it will have, we will have a total of 181,000 infections at the peak, and we'll be having 3,300 per day but with social distancing, we were expecting 53,000 infections and one, that's at the peak and 1,000 infections per day. This was a similar projection by the WHO and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Now there was another projection by the Policy Analysis Unit of the President's Office we showed 74 to 93% of the population might be affected. The peak was initially expected on the 17th May 2020. However, it will interest the honorable members to know that in fact, the picture is gloomier. The new projections have been made based on new data and the spread of the disease so far in the African countries and what we have learned about the disease so far. It is now projected that without any social distancing, we are now expecting a total of 300,000 cases in a period of 300 days. That is, it spreads, that's the estimate for the one year. But when it peaks, we expect to have what 3,000 cases a day, and at the peak, there will be 10,000 active cases in this country. But with strict social distancing, with the assumption that there will be reduction in contact by 50%, we would expect a total of 1,600 cases in 300 days. So we see the drastic reduction from 300,000 to 1,600 with strict social distancing. 
and a total of 30 active cases per day at the peak. And we would expect six to seven new cases to be registered per day, adding on to the total number of active cases, of course, while some are withdrawn from the total number of active cases because they might have, they would have recovered. The peak expected again. Now from the projections, we are saying from the first case without social distancing, the peak would have been on the 25th. Now with some social distancing, we expect the new peak to be around the 24th of June, 2020. This shows that most likely the initial social distancing observed by the population has shown dividend as the peak has been, has moved from its original date of 17th May. This will allow a flattened curve and allow care of the patients and the patients hopefully get better with this when the curve is flattened rather than spiking up. Staff protection. Madam Speaker, distinguished honorable members, as we speak, we have adequate number of face masks, gloves, goggles, shields, shoe covers, overalls for the people who work in the health facilities. Yes, we agree, sometimes there are logistic challenges and sometimes the slow flow of information. And sometimes people taking ownership is lacking. When these items are finished at some sites, they fold their arms and expect them to be flown to them rather than being proactive to make the request before it even gets finished. This is the typical attitude. So I'm not surprised that you went to some centers, they say we don't have. And the question to them is, what did you do when you didn't have? Because I must tell, I'm, I'm informing you that we have enough of these items for the protection of our staff. Equally speaking, we equally have been supplying the security forces. It was not in a very well coordinated manner initially because they used to give to an, a one person who was supposed to deliver it. But we realized that there were logistic challenges and the, uh, the, the interior minister promised to identify a focal point who will do the collection and get it to all the people and he has done that now. So that will also be, uh, be, be, be lessened now. Uh, st staff on our area. The issue of the staff on our area is yet to be finalized. Uh, distinguished speaker, distinguished National Assembly members, COVID-19 period is a very difficult period for everybody in the world, for all of us, especially in developing countries. It is very tasking for the population, but more so for the health workers. I will tell you, and more so for the health ministers, but I think it is most difficult for the health minister of the Republic of the Gambia because the Gambia has special, is a special case. So instead of us to deal with the response to COVID-19, strategizing, develop the policies, we deal with allowances and the allowance list and this and that and that. The Gambia is unique in the sense that things that ministers are not supposed to be dealing with just come to the bear and if you don't deal with it, there is disaster. So you end up having to deal with that. This allowance issue is very unfortunate. Government came up with the idea that, and as we've been saying ever since, no one can ever pay health workers enough, especially frontline health workers. When people are sleeping, 
when people are doing other things, when people are enjoying, celebrating, these frontliners are at front there, risking their lives to provide healthcare for our people. But government said, let's give them honoraria, just a token to say thank you very much. Now, this honoraria, we said, provide us with the list of the people who are at the front line. The problem started, unfortunately, especially when the 500 million was announced. That's when our problem as a health ministry started. Unfortunately, people start to even forget about COVID. All they talk about is money, money, money. That's why I said our work is very, very difficult. Now, we say provide the list. When we talk about these things, it is not the majority, it's just in the minority that do some of these things. The majority are hardworking, dedicated, sacrificing their lives for the people of this country. Now, that minority provided a list. In fact, when you look at the list and the estimates, it consumed the entire, almost the entire $500 million for allowances. That was the suggestion. Of course, we wouldn't accept that. We said to them, it's a non-starter. It went back. Then they brought another list. That list was so big. We say, where are these people? I said, okay, if this is, list is big, bring it, let us have a look. We looked at the list. They were names of over 300 volunteers. Nobody knows where those volunteers. That means they are not working in the health sector. So if they are volunteers. Now that also went. We said, no, non start again. Remove all the volunteers. Bring the list of the core people. The list of the core people was brought. Some people came together to say, we know the people who are the active players. That list came. We saw names appearing in one section and another and another and another. Then I said, no again. Took the bliss back. Then we went to Kotu, that's where our central operations are. That day, that day, as health minister, I stayed with the team to project because we wanted to give some of them something because you, had, you all had their complaints. It was difficult for them sometimes. They go leave home early, they don't go home, they don't go home early. So we said, let's mobilize quickly to give them something. But we need a list. Now we looked at the list. I was there with them. They projected the names till 2 a.m. in the morning. I don't think any health minister does that in the world. That's not my responsibility. But if I don't do that, what will follow is disaster. Now, we looked at it. As we looked at it, we realized that there were various duplication. That night alone, 300 names were removed. Why were they removed? Because you will see some names at some point and so many names. Then we say, okay, you have the team leaders here. Team this, team that, team this. When we project it, if these are in your team, you say yes, because you know them. Look at your own list. But you also equally take responsibility because you are here and you say this. Are, oh, then you start saying, I don't know that one. I've never seen this one. Who put this name? Now, this is what we do. So we went down there. I say, since there are various groups, let us now arrange them alphabetically so that when the groups are there, you arrange the groups, you arrange all the names, ignoring the groups alphabetically. Then you see one name three times, four times, six times. Then we had to remove it. These are the challenges that we faced. Now, when we streamline the list, we now say each one should get paid 5,000 on a row. When that was made, they started. Then some started saying they were not involved, these ones are not involved. But the initial one was to pay uh, the frontliners first. And the frontliner definition was those who were in the contact tracing, the surveillance, the laboratory, the case management team, and in, just in the health facilities, case management team, the people at the accident and emergency wards, and the people who are also at the outpatient units, because accident and emergency and outpatient are the people who receive any patient coming into a health facility. When they come and they suspect COVID, 
they allowed the case management team in that facility. So this we regarded as frontliners. Now, so this is what delayed the list. Now we said compile another, uh, compile the list now. Some payments started, but th that was a limited number. That is why the others couldn't get paid. Because now they, they, they started wrangling and some people from some facilities were putting in their friends, their real relatives to be in, the, in that frontliner. So even to get those frontliners. But we said, let's get the frontliners paid first so that the rest of the people will also get paid. Probably a little less because you, we have to stratify. Because if we don't stratify, the person who goes to take a sample from a patient is more at risk. But a person who is sitting down in the health facility is also at some risk. But you cannot compare them with this. If you make it flat, the person who goes to follow the patients will be complaining. He will say, oh, I'm risking my life. And look at it. This one is sitting at this place. And the, so we said it's important to certify. Now, the nurses came up. Unfortunately, uh, you know, some of the people were also on the media talking and so on without engagement. But we had a very positive engagement because when the goals are the same, there's no need to quarrel. So when we brought them, one very smart, uh, honest uh, young nurse, when we say to them, okay, you go and see your people who have not been paid and they have complaints, jot their names down and come. Then he came and told me, Honorable, I was shocked when I went now because there's going to be stratification. Now everybody in any facility now is moving to work at the emergency room because now emergency room people are going to be paid more. So we are seeing names that were ordinarily posted in other parts of the hospital, all now being added to emergency room. So this is a nightmare we're having with the allowances, but the willingness is there. In fact, I myself was the one following them to produce this list four weeks ago. Now, why are we having some of these problems? Honorable members, distinguished honorable members, distinguished speaker, I think we inherited a bad system. That's the bottom line. Some of the things, the same old people are still there. They got used to this bad system of doing things. We talk about the Ebola. Unfortunately, Ebola funds were wasted in this country. And that's what they want to do with this. And we say no. That's why some of them are up and against. The Ebola funds were wasted here. What that would have done today, our health system wouldn't have been like this. But equipment were said to have been procured, we never got to this country. Nobody sees them. Allowances were put together. Then the allowances were being given as impressed. I learned. I was not there then, but they were being given as impressed. And people held this impress in bags, and they go and pay selected people, and the rest only they, and God knows where the rest went to. Some people were left as response teams that time for three months, and they never got paid a dime. And they are still here. If you investigate, you'll get to know. Now, why are we saying this? Because the same people are still there. Now they don't have that access and they are sabotaging our system. For them, things should not work. To them, things should fail. To them, things should not work, irrespective, because they don't have their way to get access to these funds. This is the frustration I must tell you I am facing as health minister in this country. That's why I say this country, being a health minister this, this COVID time, is probably the most difficult work. They go to the media and make allegations without verifying. They hear one or two things, not knowing what the story is about. They go and fabricate. Instead of us to concentrate on the work to defeat COVID, we have to now debunk their lies because so that the people know what the truth is. We have a bad system where we have people, middle-level people, who have been spending monies in here, building homes that three, four, five big story buildings in town in this ministry, they are there. We have people who go around to, to border points because they position people there to be collecting little, little fees from them every weekend. Now we remove those people. We said, no, you are not good for the health sector. You are not good for those places. They are very angry because to them, Dr. Samate came to destroy their way of life. So they are up in arms and doing all kinds of havoc, undermining us because they have grievances. Now, I'll give you an example, a very sad example. 
if a former minister could call a program manager as recent as two, three weeks ago to say to him to send him fuel coupons, then we have a problem in this country. So that means when those people were there, what would they have done when they were in charge of those resources? Now that they are not even there, they are saying, program manager, do you have fuel coupons to send to me? So this is the reality in this, our country, and it is sad. So this is why we have a big battle to do. So, but the allowance payment is ongoing, and we are certified. We've brought them all so that we go around to see how soon they can be paid. Thank you. When it comes to intersectoral collaboration, we collaborating uh, with, with the police, we collaborating with the security forces, the Ministry of Defense, and all other parties. It had been difficult initially, but the Cabinet Subcommittee has brought us all together, and that has been helping us very well. Now, there's also the appointment of uh, a COVID-19 response coordinator, uh, one gentleman, Mr. Senghor, whose role is to coordinate these activities so that when the security forces need something, it goes through him and he knows who to contact. If they need protective gear, he knows who to contact so that they facilitate that. We believe that is essential. Training. Training has been ongoing in all the regions. It is still ongoing. Uh, there is still a lot to cover with regards to uh, what to do. Uh, most of the frontliners have been trained now but we're training all the other people, the community health workers equally, and the partners are helping very well in the coordination of the training. Madam Speaker, distinguished uh, uh, National Assembly members, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is real. It is of great concern in the Gambia. I think sometimes uh, when Allah helps people or when their efforts are yielding results, then they become complacent. They think, after all, even if we didn't do anything, it would have been like this. I think that's what we are having in the Gambia. Because if we don't pray, we don't pray for that, but if People were dying in communities, one after the other, one after the other, one after the other. Probably we will say, hey, this is real. But we don't want to see that. We certainly do not want to see that. We appeal, and I add my voice to the Justice Minister to appeal. You have the authority, you have the power, to support government to make this our collective fight a success. The people of this country look up to you, and we certainly look up to you to give us, I would still have said, the 90 days, but we leave it to you because we remember what I initially said was probably a lockdown. These new cases we got, if at all we had robust systems, robust, if people were abiding, probably they wouldn't have surfaced. But we are very concerned because COVID is now in the community. When it will, it will, it will blow up, it will explode. We don't know, but we sincerely appeal to give this a strong consideration. I hope in the speech I was able to answer the questions of most people uh, long together though but if there's any then we'll be well, willing to answer once again i thank you for your indulgence thank you very much honorable minister um the 